Hello, everyone, and welcome to Liquid Margins, Community in Composition, Annotation, and English Education. Thank you all for being here. Today's guests are Laura Roche, PhD candidate in English Rhetoric at Indiana University, Alex Penn, visiting lecturer at Indiana University, Rami Kalir, Assistant Professor of Learning Design and Technology at the University of Colorado, Denver. I'm also proud to say that Ramey is our 2021 Hypothesis Scholar in Residence. Um, we have got a guest moderator today, Justin Hodgson, Associate Professor of Digital Rhetoric in the English Department at Indiana University. And with that, um, thank you for listening to this introduction and housekeeping. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Justin. I thought I would start by uh, taking a moment to sort of introduce you to how we got to where we are, um, and then maybe sort of situate some points in relationship to the connections between social annotation and writing studies more formally. Um, but this, this project, which is now a nine member research team, right? Looking at, I don't know, it grows every day. I feel like I'm picking up people, like I'm collecting cats or something. But, uh, you know, we, we started in the spring redesigning our online first year composition course, which is, um, you know, a standard composition course like any other place. But uh, we have a multitude of options within that frame. But we wanted to expand our offerings for online. Um, and this was, of course, before the pandemic uh, disrupted everything. We had a plan. We were going to make some quick changes. And, and as part of those initial conversations, we thought we would like to improve the level of engagement students have with some of the course text that we require them to read that they then use to think through uh, some of the key ideas and concepts from uh, the course. And so we were making progress and Alex and, and Laura were on, on the project team redesigning our online class. So they both have extensive experience teaching online and teaching our W131 course. And then the, uh, we decided, you know, after the pandemic hit that we would take our little boutique offering and scale it up for the entirety of our freshman composition course, which is roughly 60 sections of first year composition per semester covering about 1,250 students. And so uh, it became very um, evident right away that we needed to make some, some changes to, to accommodate not only the different kinds of instructors who would be teaching this course, um, but people who've never taught online, but very specifically instructors who've never taught at all before either. So many of them are first time teachers in a first time space and in first time online. Um, but the one thing that remained, I think, consistent for us across was uh, the potential value we saw in Hypothesis for helping recreate some of the community and engagement that occurs in our online space. And so uh, this is literally one of those moments in life where the cart was actually before the horse, because as we built this thing, um, moving into July, it dawned on us that we're going to have this huge data set now. All the students are participating in online through our Canvas course. They're doing all their annotations and hypothesis, and, and they turn all their assignments in through these two digital repositories for the most part. So we would have access to everything they've written for the class that's gradable and part of their development, as well as all their annotations. And that's when we reached out uh, formally to working with Jeremy Dean at, at Hypothesis, and he in turn connected us with Ramey to figure out, well, what, what could a research project look like and what would it look like and how could we actually discern things of value from this process or product. Uh, but the reality is we just have way too much information. <laughs> and so we're like, we should do something with it. Okay, we should figure out how to make something out of this. Uh, and so we began this journey of trying to figure out what that looks like. That makes sense, everybody. So far, I've got everyone on the board. We're all on the same page. I haven't missed any steps yet. Um, and so then we, we began the process of going through IRB. Um, and I have battle wounds, if you like to, you know, they, I wear them deeply, trauma through IRB. Uh, it's an ongoing fund service for those of you who've done IRB before. And, uh, but we, we, we got approved, for, our study got approved, our protocols are in place and starting as of yesterday, I think officially, we, we are already gathering data. So we are at the first stages of actually making sense of what we have and what hypothesis is doing. But we have a lot of hypotheses, uh, no pun intended, uh, about what the study might uh, reveal to us. And that includes not only thinking about social annotation as a writing activity, um, but as well as like the process of how those activities Im impact student writing, how they lead to things like community development, how instructors are teaching it, how that process relates to the engagement, whether or not they bring it up in a synchronous class. Um, and so that's the, the larger frame. As a quick 
uh, maybe a quick overview. Alex, you want to break down a little bit, like how does our course work in terms of the structure so that people get a sense of, you know, the synchronous, asynchronous kind of dynamic? Yeah, so the current model we have is a mix of synchronous and asynchronous fully online instruction. So we um, ended up with our model because we had courses converted a little bit at the last minute in the fall. They were originally taught three days a week. So we ended up with a model where that first day a week was replaced with asynchronous instruction and activities. And then the other two days were replaced with synchronous uh, instruction via Zoom. And so a place that a lot of the hypothesis stuff is happening, in fact, all of the built-in assignments is in that asynchronous Monday. So where normally students might in the regular classroom read an essay over the weekend, come in and discuss it. What they do instead is read the essay over the weekend, make some annotations as they're reading, and then before coming to the next class, respond to their peers. Uh, so that is sort of both replacing the discussion that would normally happen synchronously, but then also preparing students to have a little bit of synchronous discussion, but to start in a more advanced place when they come to that synchronous Zoom class. Does that sort of help? Farad, I muted. Uh, uh, yeah, that's perfect. I, I just I think it's important to understand the context within which we're using the tool. Um, I think most folks who who know anything about social annotation will tell you it makes sense that it would connect to a class that involves reading text and writing. I mean, I don't think that's a stretch. But when you think about how it operates um, in the online space, uh, for us, it's really critical to the experience it provides. More so, I think, uh, at least as we approached it as designers, it was about the experience more so than just how does it help annotate and engage the content. And so it's a it's a really fun dynamic to think about. We were replacing an in-class discussion component um, five times a semester with a social annotation activity that would lead into an in-class conversation um, as a way of augmenting that experience. And so that's sort of, I just wanna make sure that listeners or, or viewers in the future um, would understand you know, it's not like a regular class for us. It's this unique hybrid that uh, was supposed to be innovative and fun, and it was, but then it became this one-size-fits-all box for every instructor in W131. Um, and so that's sort of how we how we got there. Uh, and then, of course, we brought on uh, Ramey, and uh, he complicated everything for us. And so <laughs> Um, but you know, Amy, you want to give some background to sort of what you see going on with our, our study, like and how it fits a little bit with some of the larger conversations. Yeah, you know, I will, and I just want to you know, first of all pass along a note of thanks, Justin, to you, Laura, Alex, just the whole team at IU, because you know, in regards to the really dynamic work that's happening at at, in, uh, at Indiana University right now and the work that's doing, you know, Justin's describing in the Department of English with social annotation, this is a really um, large scale kind of fundamental shift in how students are interacting with texts, interacting with each other and interacting with their, their curriculum. Um, and to do so at the kind of scale that, that Justin and Alex and Laura will describe and to do so really with a lot of intentional pedagogy, instructional planning, approaches to assessment. Um, this is really unique and what has made me so excited about this work and I think what's really excited Hypothesis as an organization is that Across the board, there are many schools, K-12 and higher ed, that are adopting social annotation because it's such an effective kind of replacement for the dreaded threaded discussion forum. And there's a lot of excitement around really using social annotation to support the kinds of learning practices that we know social annotation encourages. It encourages meaning making, it encourages textual analysis, it encourages peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, and it's a really useful way of setting up future writing activities, such as composing essays and thinking analytically. Um, and so again, there's just a lot of enthusiasm around social annotation right now. And the, again, the real intentional approach that Justin and, and Alex and Laura, the whole team at IU, the whole team of the Department of English has taken to make this a kind of department-wide commitment to really support a whole host of instructors. Again, Justin mentioned, and we're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of sections across multiple classes. Uh, our work will you know, ultimately touch not only thousands and thousands of students, but potentially hundreds of faculty and structures. This is a really uh, consequential uh, endeavor that we're embarking upon here. And so yes, there are a lot of questions to ask, a lot of interesting research that we can do, but I, I just really want to kind of start by pointing, you know, just you know, pointing out that, that this is really um, a, a unique kind of educational 
situation that that has kind of emerged um, in Bloomington and also online, and we're just so excited about that. So just again, thanks there for, for, for that. For that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we 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 had a project in mind and it keeps growing every time we meet just, you know, um, so we started out with W131 as our focus and that's probably the primary area of our conversation today. But for folks who might want to know, we, we have expanded our, our data collection and our inquiry practices to include a series of literature courses, introduction to fiction, introduction to poetry, introduction to drama, I believe. Um, and then a couple other, what we call L200 classes uh, that are related to the critical reading and writing. Um, and then we have another section of classes called the W-170s, which are topic specific courses that actually count for W-131 credit. And so we are including them. I think it's also important to recognize that at IU, um, we have what are called two foundations courses, two courses that are required by every student, no matter what your major and discipline. And W-131 is one of those two foundations courses. So it is uh, required uh, by everybody. Um, and I think if, as this works, um, it may end up causing us to also think about how social annotation could be pushed backwards towards our ACP credit um, and other transfer possibilities as students bring credits into the, the university to count for this experience. But that's sort of the, the bigger bigger frame. Um, you know, Laura, you wanna take a minute to talk about like how this works in practice in terms of what is what does our actual hypothesis activities look like? Could you, could you break that down for folks? Yeah, so um, students in 131 at least will read five different texts throughout the semester. And um, they are responsible for using hypothesis to annotate those texts. A lot of the instructors will prompt the students with a few questions to consider as they're reading the text. Some um, even plant questions in the text for students to come across as they're reading. But for the most part, it's pretty uh, student-led. It the, the instructors do, for the most part, very little when it comes to actually guiding the student discussion. It's very much student run. And I think Alex and Justin and even Rainey can speak to the advantages of that from a pedagogical and just like <laughs> emotional perspective. Um, but the it's a pretty low stakes assignment as far as we've designed it. I think it's worth maybe like five points, <laughs> um, but it does hold the students accountable for doing the work because there's this sense of performativity involved where they uh, have to converse with their, their fellow peers. They know that people are going to be reading what they've written along uh, beyond just the instructor looking at that. And so it promotes more thoughtful, I think, engagement with the text and conversation with the students as a whole. Perfect. Let me, um, within within our, again, the two course, the, we have kind of like two trees, if you want to think about it that way. We have the 131 side where instructors do their own thing. And then there's all these other courses that have their own variation as well. Uh, in, in W131, uh, our actions with hypothesis require uh, students to do three uh, additive annotations and two responsive annotations. And each one of those additive components, those initial sort of engagements with the text are framed around either a prompt that um, we've provided as a generic prompt or the instructors customize. Uh, then the second one's around a discussion question that the instructors are supposed to add themselves based on their theme and the readings they've chosen. Uh, and then the third one I think is a make it ask a question of the text. And so it's real formulaic and it's meant to be a starting point from which instructors work, not meant to control what they do. It gives them some grounding to begin with. And, and we did this all last semester. So my hope and, and expectation is this semester when we're gathering data for the first time, that those who had the experience last semester now feel more comfortable taking some liberties with reshaping those questions or reshaping those prompts to fit maybe a little more systematic with what they do pedagogically, but also with their, their content and delivery. And so that's sort of like the, the nuts and bolts of it all, right? Um, from a compositional standpoint, our, our conversation begins really with how can we improve student writing, right? And uh, at the core, we want to help students not only to develop as writers, but to develop, you know, critical thinking, analytical skills and practices. And our entire W131 course as a core element of IU is built around analysis for the most part. Um, learn, students learning to critically read a text and to apply those ideas elsewhere. And so the one thing that's remained true in my years here at IU 
is that the better students understand those critical texts they choose that are chosen for them, the better they apply the ideas. So there's no, I mean, there's no substitute for clarity of thought when it comes to being a solid and excellent writer. And, you know, that, that approach to helping them understand the text is sort of where everything began for us because so much of their success in the class is dependent, in, in, at least in part, on how well they're able to read and understand and then leverage the ideas from those essays. So we wanted to give them a, an extended space to think about engagement that doesn't just require the instructor to drive that process. Um, and I think so far, given that we had a, a bit of a, was it, was it a workshop professional development activity yesterday? And you know, we had about eight or nine instructors show up, some of which have used it, some of which hadn't. Um, and given the conversations, I think so far the preliminary indications are it's working quite well, right? Um, at least from those who showed up. But it's 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 interesting to think about, you know, the experience students are having and how that activity in social annotation is working for them in class, or in this case, from the instructor's perspective, what are they noticing? What are they not? And so I thought maybe we could go um, to go back to Alex a little bit here to talk about her experiences because of us, Alex is the only one that's actually taught this course with this tool. Um, Laura and I have taught the online course and helped design it, but we are not at, weren't actually teaching it last semester. So uh, Alex is the only one of us here with actual experience on the ground for, for this activity. Um, Cause then Ramey doesn't teach for us. Right. So no matter how much I keep asking him to, he doesn't just sign up. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, Alex, could you walk through a little bit like, you know, what has been your experience? How did you approach it? Uh, maybe help folks get a sense uh, of, you know, the ins and outs of your encounter so far. Yeah. So it might be helpful to give a little background. I've been teaching online for a few years now in uh, a slightly different version of this course that did not use hypothesis. And so, um, you know, I could see that students maybe didn't have as much engagement with the text as they would in a traditional classroom where maybe we'd hand them paper texts or require them to print paper texts or give them paper texts or something like that. Uh, and I could also see that even though we had these synchronous classes where we met face to face and where I was able to form these personal connections with students, there was also this problem where students weren't really connecting as much with each other as they would in a traditional classroom. And I was really struggling with ways to facilitate that. So enter hypothesis this past semester. Uh, hypothesis really allowed me to do two different things. More, more, I'm sure, but but two of the things it allowed me to do that I really appreciated were, on the one hand, it got my students much more engaged with the texts and um, at a nitty gritty close reading level so that when they went back to write their essays, they could really incorporate details from the texts and and they just had much better contact with the texts in class discussions and in their writing. And then on the flip side, Hypothesis created the space for my students to be with each other and hear each other's ideas and respond to each other's ideas where I was largely absent. So I didn't do a lot of responding to or moderating their annotations. I would grade them. There's a very easy way to grade them in Canvas, but then that like did not show up, of course. So what they were seeing on the text was um, each other's ideas, each other's comments, each other's questions. Uh, our very favorite, my very favorite prompt that we had for them was ask a question of the text. And very quickly, I think students realized that really um, they should be asking questions to each other about the text. And so I have, I have one beautiful little example here, if I can find it. Uh, we were reading Foucault, um, an excerpt from, from Birth of the Prison on panopticism. And uh, one of my students asked this question that had four other students then respond to it. She said, what do you think are some of the psychological effects of thinking that you are always being watched? but never actually knowing if you are. And so a whole bunch of students responded to this in really interesting ways that helped everyone understand the text better and then in turn use that text to, to analyze our films. So I would say for, for me, my experience with Hypothesis has been very positive in both practical ways, uh, increasing that contact with the text that we always want, but also increasing the students' contact with each other, which has been really nice to see. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, it's, it, I mean, we, we've been over this sort of practice and process in, in terms of what are the, what are the best outcomes, what are our best forms of engagement. And hopefully as we learn more from, you know, not only our instructors, but the, the way we are analyzing and looking at information from them and from the student perspective, we can get a better sense of actually what is working well for them beyond just how well the tool itself is working. And so I, I think the pedagogical component is, 
absolutely important. Um, we had a question, I think Jen had asked in the, in the chat about seeing an example in, in, in the system. So I wanna pull, share my screen real quick and just show what it looks like for us um, in the W131. Let me see if I can make this happen today. It's a tech event, right? So this should probably fail miserably, the way, right? That's how it's supposed to work. All uh, right, and we'll just share that. Can I assume we can all see that? We got a nod, okay. Um, uh, so anyways, in, in our typical, this is actually a course from last semester. So I can show you some things, but I can't show actual annotations because it would be a FERPA uh, issue um, uh, identifying students in that way. But um, the basic structure is we have a weekly module set. This is a, what they do before the semester begins and gives them information and, and things of that nature. And we have resources built into our Canvas modules for instructors on how to actually connect or stitch a text to a hypothesis activity, you know, how to use hypothesis, hypothesis in the classroom. We have some of that training material, but um, for us, it really begins uh, sort of week two, where we have this thing called Monday Peer Engagement, which Alex mentioned earlier, and Laura kind of went over a little bit. And we initially called it collaborative annotation because, well, we didn't know there was a thing called social annotation. We, this is what we thought it was a collaborative activity is the way we were thinking about it. Um, but so the, you, you would, the students would see this, all the green is what they would see. Um, they would click that activity there and it would open up this, act, this assignment. Um, and so it's week two, gives them the purpose of the assignment. And then it breaks down their specific task, you know, three annotations and two responses. So each text they engage, they have to have at least five um, sort of creation activities with it um, or five engagements. And then the additives have the prompt, the question and the um, asking a question frame that I mentioned earlier. And then the responses are basically respond to two of your peers. And so students would come through here, they have our little design canvas um, space and we added all these fun little images and, and whatnot to make it a little more visually engaging. And then at the bottom, they would click this button. It's not working right now because it's, uh, I currently blocked it so I don't accidentally open up Hypothesis. Uh, but this is a, a button that would click and link out and that would open up Hypothesis for the essay um, in a new window and the students can um, annotate it uh, how they see fit from that point, um, like any other Hypothesis activity. And so you can see here, like on this one, we have the question, this is I think on Je uh, Cohen's uh, essay on monsters, right? And so the question is, why did I assign this essay for a class about monsters is the theme of the class. And so that's the, the frame frame so far in this process. Let me see if I can see that. Okay, time for, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing to go that. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's relatively a seamless uh, process um, in Canvas. For those of you who are Canvas users, there's two ways of, uh, of a stitching or creating a hypothesis activity. There's one as an assignment and there's one as like a, just a module element as an external tool. However, if you want to use the speed grader function, uh, which I highly recommend if you get into that process, then you need to actually set it as an assignment so that you can um, work individually through students' annotations. So each one of our students are required to do five. And in speed grader, I can quickly pull up Sarah Smith's five, right? And I can just see them. And, um, and for most of us, I think our approach was, we really thought of this more as a completion activity, not a, can I grade your intellectual engagement? Um, and, and the process being it's an opportunity to, to not only intervene and highlight things that are, are successful or really great questions and bring them to discussion, but also really, uh, I think the phrase yesterday was course correct, right? <laughs> um, if a student is sort of drifting really far off from the point, or as Alex uh, often says, I ask them to identify the thesis and they almost always say the counter thesis is the thesis. Um, you can insert your own comments at that point, uh, privately in the speed grader, uh, with the tool, but if you spend any time with it at all, you'll, you're probably familiar with this process as well. But so that's our, that's at least one of our, our examples. Um, I don't know exactly how it looks like in, in all the literature classes because they, they have more control over their own design, whereas this is a, a campus shell, a canvas shell blueprint course that we push out to all the instructors in 131. And so that's why it has all those designed features in it. Um, but it's, a, that's the basic, basic process so far. If, I find, if you don't mind me jumping and picking up on a point that Alex mentioned a few moments ago, when she was talking a little bit about some of the decisions that she's making as an instructor in her class with her students in response to the kinds of annotations. And thank you for reading through that thread. That was really awesome to kind of hear students thinking through that. Um, and also a little creepy given the go, but in any case, it was really, it was really fun. Um, I want to mention that given the course context that both again, Laura, Alex, and Justin have all spoken to at this point, um, one of the interesting things from, from my perspective as a researcher, but again, also somebody who has taught with hypothesis in many of my classes for many years now, um, is that there's actually not a whole lot that's well known and well documented about how to teach 
with social annotation, period. Um, there's just not a lot out there. You know, for liquid margins, this webinar series is now filling a really urgent need. Again, as social annotation becomes a more popular teaching and learning activity, particularly in higher education, there's a need to begin to kind of capture these anecdotal stories, you know, perspectives from professors, kind of instructional moves. It's really important to make these stories more accessible and to do this kind of like public, you know, sharing of practice as a way to kind of reflect upon effective instructional strategies. That said, again, there's actually very little research about how educators actually plan their instruction, teach with, assess, and then reflect upon their use of social annotation. That literature really doesn't exist. Again, we know on the student side of things that social annotation does a whole lot, and we can get into that, and that's, again, related but distinct. And so what I think is so uh, generous of everyone at, at Indiana University and what is just such an important commitment on behalf of the department and all of the instructors has been a willingness to say, this is an opportunity to really also study faculty practice, to begin to learn a little bit about some of the examples and dynamics that have come up. So for, for example, like again, like Alex was sharing, how much do instructors kind of step back and let their students kind of own the margins and kind of try and make meaning on their own? What does that really look like? And what does that feel like? And how do you kind of plan to create that kind of flexibility? And when do instructors step in to try and tell people that they can't quite identify the right thesis and the right argument and you know, things like this. And so these are all things that we hope to learn as we not only study what students are, are, are learning, but also what instructors are doing. Had to unmute, sorry. Um, the, you know, it, Ramey, you, you've raised an interesting comment. I think the most fascinating thing about our workshop development thing yesterday with this, the, the faculty who were teaching with this uh, at IU uh, came specifically from the questions and challenges instructors were having. I think, you know, it was a nice professional development moment to help guide folks in the use of the tool and to think about its practices. But I know uh, Brian, one of our instructors had mentioned, uh, and then a couple others echoed this sentiment, which is, um, they found that the students would do these really great annotations in the hypothesis activity and then not want to repeat their information in class. But they, they felt like they did, like, why would I regurgitate this? We already had this conversation in the threads. And so, uh, you know, this need to think about, well, does it facilitate conversation or is it the beginning part for a larger or a more extended conversation or moving in a new way? And so, you know, Brian had some really interesting ideas about how he is adapting to that and, and looking for gaps and, and moving the conversation forward. But I, would, I never, like, as we started this, I never anticipated this possibly closing conversation, right, in the classroom discussion. Um, but it, it does raise those things, those questions, like, you know, how do we teach with it? What do we do with it? How does the, what practices are available that we know that might be best practices? Um, and then how does it work across disciplines? So your know, writing is one sort of frame, uh, but, you know, I, I see this having obvious implications in history and in sociology and, and any of the courses that require sort of critical reading as a fundamental component uh, of their course engagement. So I just, I don't know, the, I think this question about the teacher thing, the teaching side of it, is at the root of, of what we are after. I know, Laura, that was one of your interests when we first started, right? Yeah, in general, I'm really interesting. Really interest. I'm really interesting. I'm really interested in um, writing pedagogy, and so I am always sort of thinking about how do we get students to do this better, how, and how do we do it better? How do we um, write with more clarity? How do we convince students to write with more clarity without losing um, depth of thought? Something that I have heard uh, is, and be an issue with students using hypothesis is not that they don't want to um, repeat what they've said, but that their annotation is significantly more thoughtful than how they write about the text in their essay. So talking about, um, or sort of building on what Justin said about this being the start of the critical thinking process, rather than sort of the climax of it, the epitome of it. Uh, I am really interested and, be, and I decided to be a part of this project because I want to figure out how we can help students understand texts as things we have conversations with, one-on-one, um, -on -one, like me with the text. And I think hypothesis 
helps facilitate that because the conversation is larger than just the student and the text at the beginning so that they can eventually evolve into writing an essay about the text that is conversational that does sort of go back and forth between I thought about this and then uh, from I thought about it from this perspective and then I thought about it from that perspective and um, sort of continuing the critical thinking process rather than stifling it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, that makes that makes perfect sense. Well, at least to me, but I'm also a scholar in writing study. So this is, you know, maybe that's a, <laughs> I mean, one of my areas. Uh, we're, we're, we got about 12 minutes left, I think, right, uh, Franny, is that correct? We're going to 1245? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm wondering if we should maybe open it up to Yeah, that's what I was thinking is if we could go to the Q&A, that would be great. If folks have questions that we can respond to or maybe help with, uh, or at least tell you how we broke it. <laughs> yeah, and I actually would like to just ask a question because it, it's really germane to what you were just talking about, about the conversation taking place in the annotation space. But then students are like, oh, I already said that. Do you think in any way there's a generational um, influence there so that this generation is more maybe comfortable speaking in the digital space. Hmm. That's Not a good complicated. Question. It just occurred to me when you were talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I know that, you know, in, in writing studies, for example, uh, Lester Fagley did some work in the 80s and 90s about the role of chatting, uh, the use of chats in classroom spaces and how that enabled voices in ways that it didn't. But it wasn't really necessarily generational. It was more about access to to content engagement and and actually having a voice in class. So the more reserved introverts felt more comfortable. As it was his claims, right? Um, but I think I, I initially I would say there might be something to that idea about students and their use of digital technologies. You know, the whole, quote unquote myth of the digital native, as I like to call it. But at this point, I think the pandemic wrecked all of our baseline. So, so um, if, if the idea was students were inherently more digital, uh, they are excessively more digital at this point, right? And, uh, and so I, I, don't, I don't know to what extent that might play a role, but that might be something for us to, I mean, to look at. Um, if, we, if we could find other studies that show maybe generational engagements, uh, that might be a nice uh, way of thinking about this. And, and yeah, I'll just pick up quickly here and kind of invert Franny's question because you know, Franny, I see your question as echoing, you know, really deep questions about practice, which is the extent to which educators are comfortable facilitating different kinds of discussions in different kinds of settings. And I think that if educators feel comfortable doing so, students will kind of rise to that occasion. Uh, you know, actually another member of our research team who's, who's with us today, Chris Andrews, who's also at IU and is a learning scientist and, you know, getting his PhD, looking at educator practice, teacher learning, um, we actually were having this conversation yesterday following this PD session, which is that this dynamic between opening up a, a social annotation conversation that is digital, that is asynchronous, that is in the margins, where students are actually having very rich, deep, meaningful conversation. And then they come to class, and the question is, does their instructor expect them to regurgitate what they've already said online, or has that instructor themselves gone through a kind of reflective professional learning process so that they understand it's time for a new kind of discussion now. When we come together, whether it's face-to-face -face over Zoom or it's face-to-face -face in a classroom when that's safe to do again, does an instructor understand that there's one conversation that was a kind of rough draft thinking, the kind of like maybe meaning making that Laura was just talking about. I'm speaking back to the text, but I'm also speaking with my peers in relationship to that text. And then what happens in that classroom conversation that is both different from, but connected to and building upon what happened online? And so, yeah, I don't know, Franny, if it's generational, but I think that our team is also, you know, again, thanks to, to folks like Chris and others, just very interested in making sure that, that instructors have the kinds of dispositions and the kinds of skills to kind of sequence these kinds of discursive-based activities to make them very meaningful for students that includes social annotation, but it uses that as a way to kind of augment other kinds of, of collaborative learning activities. Yeah, that's great. I, I just typed in the chat, like I, as, you, as you're describing it, it makes me think of all the flipped classroom practices, right? And how instructors have to adjust. Writing has done that for a while, right? But but this is like hypothesis come becomes like a flipped classroom kind of component, man. I think that's uh, that, that's a great, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm gonna, I put notes down. I'm going to revisit this later. This is how it works, right? Um, I know we had a question, uh, Nate, you had, you had mentioned, I think Nicholas had a question that you wanted to bring up. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, and Alex was sort of riffing on it too. And I think it was, um, you know, around this, it sort of grows out of the discussion you just had in a way about how can discussion be different, right? And it's, um, part of it is this idea of, you know, our students um, and because of pedagogy being kind of trapped in a world where they're treating each learning experience as kind of a singular modular activity and how do how can we draw connections across modules in a course or even across courses or across you know academic careers and you know can social annotation play a role in that Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so, so there's a in, in writing studies we have transference as a as a, one of the core concepts that have emerged in the last you know I would say decade and a half. Um, transference of skills, transference of rhetorical capacities from the context of a writing class to not only other classes on campus, but then beyond the academic frame. Um, I know we you know in W one thirty one we create it's a thematic thing, and the idea is to try and intentionally weave theme theme based elements and engagements and skills from unit one to unit two to unit three and there are activities that are designed for that they don't always work um and and if you get into when when education gets defaulted to canvas right uh if it's completely controlled by canvas and zoom then it inherently orients students around modules and completion activities rather than sustained engagement and so it actually takes significantly more effort to create that inter integrated kind of uh, theme element or, or through line um, and how it works than it does in a regular face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, at least that's been my experience teaching online. Um, I haven't done it with Hypothesis, but overall that's been been the, the place. But Alex, you, you had some things you mentioned in, in the response, right? What, what did you have to say? Yeah, and I must say this is largely hypothetical at this point because in the fall, I don't think I did this, but it's something I want to do going forward is ask my students as one of their three annotations for every text. I want to ask them to make a connection either to another text we've read or a class discussion we've had or to the real world or to another one of their classes, which I think there's some research around this being like a place where a lot of learning happens for students where they start making connections between their classes. Um, and so, you know, that's not like a immediate solution to this much bigger problem, but I'm hoping that'll help students get in in the mode of thinking about how these learning experiences can go from being these discrete modular things to being these more interconnected cumulative things. It does. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ramey. Are you sure? Okay. Uh, it does fall to, in my opinion, the instructor to facilitate the those connections and to encourage the transfer of um, thinking and knowledge because students are so used to compartmentalizing not only their courses but the coursework within their courses like in a test-based culture students are learning 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 taking the test forgetting to make room for more learning 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 for another test so um something that brought me into writing studies was the practice of mindfulness and encouraging students to be actively aware of the thoughts that are coming in that might seem unrelated, but are actually tangential to and um, connected with the core, I don't know, text that's being studied. So encouraging students to sort of follow the uh, distractions and think about where they're taking them and not uh, I guess not discouraging somebody who's reading Foucault in their 131 class from thinking about how that applies to their psych 101 course that they're also taking. So really keeping it open ended and saying, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, even if you don't answer the question, like Alex was saying, letting students respond to students is a really valuable way to continue the conversation. Laura, that's great. I'll keep this really brief, which is just to say that, you know, to, to Nicholas's point here, and to, again, the comments that have now been made, I think one of the unfortunate um, side effects among many of the educational aspects of the, you know, shifts to everyone online, pandemic pedagogy, everyone's now a digital educator, is that there will be, I think, for many students, a feeling that online learning is increasingly highly structured, kind of formal by default, um, very modular and sequential in a way that really can, some may perceive, delimit the kinds of 
divergent, interest-driven, and messy learning that occurs you know, wherever it may be. Now, I've obviously drunk the Kool-Aid here, but I think that there are actually few, <laughs> but some very useful learning technologies that show a very different possible future for digital and online learning. And I think that social annotation is certainly one of those, where social annotation, to get to Laura's point right now, certainly what Alex was just mentioning about making connections, social annotation is inherently about these associative trails, these way in which cognition is distributed and stretched across people that you're in conversation with, resources, ideas, and all of that occurs over time. This can't by definition be bounded necessarily to a class, a semester, you know, modular one readings to module two readings, et cetera. And so, you know, once higher ed writ large kind of moves into whatever post pandemic phase of teaching and learning, we may eventually find ourselves in in the next few years, um, I think that there will need to be a kind of pretty radical reset on what it means to teach and learn online once everybody's kind of again out of this emergency mode. And I think that few technologies and few practices will actually survive as kind of very meaningful things that we should continue to do. But I believe that social annotation will be one of those things. That's great. That's great, Remy. Uh, Remy, it's uh, 1244. I know there's at least two more questions I think we want to touch on real quickly. Um, before we run out of time, uh, and I'm happy to stick around for an extra few minutes just to, to respond to some things. Uh, the first one is Muffy had a question and I just lost it. It was about how much time do faculty spend training students because uh, you should notice that, um, where is it at? I just hit the button and it all disappeared. Um, essentially that student, students are not digital natives. I don't care what anyone tells you. They don't come with some grand ability to work with technologies. They might have an affinity for making things work, but many of them don't have any experience with your LMS. And so for them, it's a whole new learning curve. Uh, in our previous online course design, our very first day was required to be in person. And we would, we would walk them through all the technological considerations they would need for that class. It was a full class day of here's how to make this online class work. However, in the pandemic moment, uh, that is no longer the case. And so I can tell you that our faculty don't, we don't, they don't intentionally provide a lot of training for students to use the system, but we have built in training modules into our Canvas shell that students can view or walk, it walks them through how to access certain materials um, or, or how to participate. There's even, I think it once as a quiz, like, are you prepared for online learning? Like that kind of basic level of not only technological support uh, inquiry, but also conceptual uh, inquiry. And so I, I, I think that we would all benefit more if students had a little more hands-on training for how to use standard university technologies. Um, but, uh, and, and maybe actually since we touch every student, maybe the, the freshman courses where that should occur. Um, but as of right now, it's, it's sort of instructor dependent and then they mostly rely on the, the few uh, training module elements we have for students in our, in the 131 design at least. Out of the other courses we work with, it's different, but um, so that's, that's the framework there. And then, oh, there it is, I lost it. The chat moves so fast. All right, and then the, um, we have one more question about, what was the, uh, yeah, the central question on in Curtis, uh, it says, um, new kinds of discussions, which makes him ask, uh, what are some of the things that can and should happen in the synchronous session that follows and builds on the asynchronous hypothesis session? Uh, and so that's his question. So uh, I'll leave it to the others here who maybe know more about this, but what, what, should, what should happen in a synchronous classroom? Alex, you've done this. What, what is your go-to strategy? <laughs> Well, I typed this a little in the chat, um, and I, I want to be sure we get to, to Remy, his, or Remy, sorry, Remy, because I know he has um, sort of some different and more interesting uh, solutions. But one very simple activity I like to do is either by Zoom poll or chat, have all the students vote on the answer to a question, either a question that students have actually posed in, in their annotations or one that comes out of their annotations. So like one, an example of one that could come out of the annotations is like some people identified the thesis as this and some people identified the thesis as this and some people identified it as this. Which one of these do you think is the thesis? And then say you do that as Zoom poll, like it pops up and then you can say like, okay, people who voted for this one, you know, what made you think this? So like that's, that's the, or it could be much simpler like so-and-so asked this, what do you guys think? Vote yes or no in the chat. 
that. And then the nice thing is um, if you do that kind of voting in the chat, you know who to call on. You can be like, oh, so-and-so, you said no. Why did you say no? Because the um, sort of impromptu participation, impromptu unmuting is harder to do in the Zoom space. So those are just some very little practical things. But I think Ramey has some um, much more interesting ideas he could probably share. Alex and I, you're, you're the expert here. I'll just, you know, just really briefly, you know, say that I put a few ideas into the chat, but I, I, I will really, maybe I'll just phrase it as a question, which is that I know a lot of people on this call and perhaps a lot of people in, you know, who are joined us in the webinar or who will watch and listen to this, I think are just really interested in the fact that these social annotation activities, they don't kind of live alone. And they are going to be paired with other kinds of learning, either assignments or activities that are very likely also collaborative or social in some way. And again, I think that there is not yet a kind of knowledge base for what that can look like. There again is very little, if any, research about what actually is effective in pairing these kinds of social annotation activities with other kinds of classes. Again, I know what I've done in my classes. I love hearing Alex and Laura, Justin, Chris is you know, here as well, like kind of riffing on like what may work for them and their students. But I think this is a really important, you know conversation to continue thinking about is how do we not only facilitate these really rich conversations with social annotation, how do they connect to the other things that we know we really care about as educators and what we ultimately want our students doing? I think that including hypothesis, a hypothesis or social annotations in the writing classroom specifically changes how students fundamentally think about writing. Like when you picture somebody reading or writing, they are doing so in isolation. Like it's the it's a hermit in the corner frantically scribbling, you know, or um, the <laughs> or reading, I suppose. It's, it's, a, it's thought of as this isolated activity when in reality, everything, all the research and writing studies shows that it is a social activity. When you're writing, you are inherently responding to something, whether it's your own thoughts, which are a product of your environment or um, somebody's comment and hypothesis. So it sort of forces students to think about um, the relationships, not only between them and the text, but between them and their classmates, between their classmates and the text, it, it humanizes writing and reading practices in a way that I think can often and easily be overlooked. I'm, I'm going to jump in. This is such a great discussion, but I'm going to jump in. We are over time. We can keep going if the panel wants to keep going, but I just want to let everyone know that if you have to jump off, you know, feel free to do so, but I just want to be a little cognizant of the time. Yeah, no, my next meeting doesn't start till one, so I got a few minutes. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is great. I mean, I think, you know, I part at the core of what we want, we hope our research will do is to illuminate uh, maybe some initial responses to these kinds of questions. I don't I don't think we have any great answers in terms of like definitive claims yet, but I think we all have really wonderful, interesting ideas about how we might do it or how we might extend it um, in our in our own specific context uh, and how that works. I mean, I, I'm I teach mostly with digital media, digital writing, digital rhetoric, um, making things for media. And I'm I'm going to include hypothesis in one of my courses this semester, and I'm going to have them focus on adding images into the text uh, as a core component. I don't know what that looks like, and so. Um, I'm intrigued to see how badly I messed this up, right? So, uh, because I learned so much when we fail, uh, fail fundamentally, right? It's like, I always talk about fast failure, fun failure, informative failure. And I really embrace those things uh, as key components of how I teach. And so I think taking chances and trying things and realizing that didn't work is just how we get better. Um, yes, they should be informed and positioned, but ultimately like, oh, I think this could work. And then you're like, no, no, that did not work at all. <laughs> at all. So, uh, and that's how our online class got built, right? So uh, if, uh, cause it's, I think it's in its third iteration now of design and, and proofing. So, um, but these questions have been fantastic. I really appreciate everybody showing up today and asking us questions and, you know, poking and prodding the inquiry. So that's great. Well, um, I think we should probably wrap this up. We're almost at the top of the hour. But I just want to say thank you to our guests. You've been wonderful, Alex, Laura, Justin, Ramey. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, there will be a recording of this. I put that in the chat, but I'll just repeat that. There will be a recording of this um, on the Hypothesis website, probably this coming Monday, the 18th, MLK Day. 
um, or before that. And it will also be on the Liquid Margins YouTube channel. I also dropped in a chat uh, a link earlier to another webinar that we have for people who just want to see, um, have a more specific walkthrough of Hypothesis as a tool and a demo. Um, we do have another webinar series called Hypothesis 101. Um, and we've got an, one coming up on January 20th, next Wednesday. So uh, look for that. Um, and I will just say uh, goodbye and thank you for coming to Liquid Margins. This has been a really great show.